In this video, we're going to be looking at part two of the basics of ecology. We're going to be focusing on energy flow within ecosystems. Now, as in the last video, some of the things that you look at in this video should be a review for you uh, from biology, but we are going to revisit it, uh, maybe clarify some, some of the concepts and maybe even misconceptions that you might have had uh, from biology till now. We know that energy flow in an ecosystem is usually one way. Always begins with the sun. The sun is the ultimate source of energy. And depending on the amount of energy that flows through an ecosystem will determine the type and number of organisms that can survive within that particular system. We know that energy is harnessed by our producers or autotrophs. Remember that our producers, our plants, our green plants, they're going to go through photosynthesis to harness that light energy. They'll be able to take that light energy and through photosynthesis convert it into a chemical energy that can be used as food. Usually that chemical energy uh, is going to be stored as starch. Remember starch is a type of carbohydrate. Other types of producers uh, that aren't plants could be possibly bacteria there are certain bacteria, extreme living bacteria, that can go through chemosynthesis, which is a way of capturing the sun's light uh, through chemical processes, not through photosynthesis. But those are going to be more extreme living bacteria or extremophiles. Um, and then algae, algae, which is going to be found in our water supplies, especially in our oceans, algae is the largest photosynthetic organism population within our oceans and they account for most of the oxygen that's replenished back into the atmosphere. Since our oceans are our largest system on the planet, then algae being the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet will be responsible for most of the oxygen that is replenishing the atmosphere. And then after our producers take in that, that light and they do convert it to energy, then our consumers are going to be our heterotrophs that take that energy from consumers or other producers by eating them. And then examples, animals. Certain types of plants can be consumers and producers, like the Venus flytrap or the, uh, the pitcher plant. Uh, those, those particular types of plants live in areas where certain nutrients like nitrogen are lacking within that system. And so they will go through photosynthesis, but they need other sources of nitrogen so they will capture insects and other types of things to get to get those resources. Now staying with consumers, we have different levels of consumers. We know we've got herbivores and our herbivores are our plant eaters. And then we have our carnivores which are just our meat eaters and then omnivores which would eat both plants and animals. Now depending on the environment, we'll, de we'll also determine what type of carnivore we have. For example, uh, Great Plains, forested areas, will have more herbivores than you would uh, carnivores or omnivores. Our savannas and deserts are going to have more of our carnivores. And then omnivores are going to be sprinkled in. Most all of our systems, most all of our ecosystems are going to contain omnivores, but some, like I mentioned, will have more carnivores or herbivores than others depending on, uh, depending on the system. And then the, the last one that kind of rounds it out, kind of helps recycle uh, the leftovers, if you will, the leftover organic matter, leftover nitrogen, phosphorus, other types of, of nutrients that, are, that can be reused. They're, these are going to be our detrovores bacteria, fungi that are going to help break down dead organic matter, waste matter, and recycle what's left uh, back into the system. Now scavengers, our detrivores, are going to include our scavengers and decomposers. Scavengers are a little different. Scavengers are going to be mainly just animals, whereas our decomposers, that type of detrivore, is going to be um, our bacteria and fungi kingdom. But our scavengers are going to be mainly animals and they're not necessarily going to help break down the same way that bacteria and fungi would. They're going to feed off of it and then their waste product then can be broken down by, our, by the decomposers. 
All right, so that was just the background of our of our different types of organisms and how they uh, how they contain or, or consume uh, energy. You put them together, and we can link energy flow and and organisms within a food chain. A food chain is just a single pathway of energy flow through an ecosystem. Now remember what's important about food chains and sometimes this can be a misconception is that the arrow points in a food chain in the direction that the energy is flowing. Alright, so if you look at this simple food chain, the grass is going to be eaten by the rabbit, then the snake is going to eat the grass, and then the, the bird will eat the snake, showing that the arrow is showing that energy is flowing in that direction. A food web is going to be multiple food chains put together and how they interact and the organisms within those food chains interact with each other to form a food web. Here's an example of a food web. Looking at this picture, you should be able to determine that there are six different possible food chains embedded within this food web. Algae being one of the main sources or the main source as a producer but then you can also notice that the small protist can also branch off and have its own food chain after that. So you're looking at possibly five to six different food chains just based on one food web. Alright, so let's get into a little bit more detail as far as energy flow through the ecosystem. We know that there are different trophic levels and these trophic levels show us what type of organism is in each level and the amount of energy that's going to be being consumed within that particular level. The first trophic level are always the producers. Those are our plants that are going to take in the sunlight and convert it into a usable form. The second level is going to be the primary consumer. So this is the primary consumer is the first consumer, usually insects, small rodents, uh, small mammals, rabbits, those types of organisms are going, they're going to be the first ones to get to the food source once it's been converted into a usable form. The third and fourth levels, now you're getting into the, the types of consumers that are going to be either meat and vegetable or plant eaters or just meat eaters. You're looking at omnivores and or carnivores. The third trophic level is going to contain your secondary consumers uh, for example, say uh, a bird, a hawk, is going to capture a rabbit. Well, the rabbit's going to be the primary consumer eating the grasses. Then the hawk is going to be the secondary consumer, which is going to eat the rabbit. Um, the fourth level, or the fourth trophic level, your tertiary consumer. This is the top predator. Okay, so say the type of hawk that ate the rabbit might have been a kestrel. That's a small type of uh, falcon, a small type of bird of prey. Well, there could be a larger bird of prey, say, uh, say a red-tailed hawk that's going to catch the smaller falcon and then eat that. So that's an example of, of those different levels. If you take a different, completely different biome, you've got, say, elephant grass that's going to be eaten by pygmy hogs in the savanna. Those pygmy hogs might be caught by, um, say, a hyena. Uh, hyenas are usually scavengers, but they will, um, they will hunt prey when necessary. And then you get a pride of lions. The pride of lions that maybe are struggling to find food might go after the hyena uh, when food is scarce. So there is your four trophic levels in action, just in a different type of biome. Here's another picture, a good picture that shows you the different levels and examples of organisms that are going to be found in those those four different levels. Be familiar with the picture, uh, with the with the levels, and just examples of organisms that can be found in those levels. Now, as far as energy goes, we know that energy is always conserved; it's never lost, it's never created or destroyed. It's just changed from one form to another. That's this idea of, or the laws of thermodynamics. So, when we're looking at energy use, we know that it's not it's not uh, consumed and destroyed after it's consumed. It's just changed to a different form. And a way we can look at that is through energy pyramids. Energy pyramids are good ways to help us identify not only the amount of each trophic level and the amount of organisms in each trophic level, but the amount of energy that passes on. Now the way this works is as you move up an energy pyramid, if you look at the pyramid, you've got the producers, which is right at the bottom, and this is the largest area because the producers, there's more producers on the planet than any other type of organism. 
more plants on the planet than any other type of organism. After that, your primary consumer would be your herbivores, and uh, the further up you go, the smaller you get. The reason that it gets smaller as you go up the pyramid is because there's less energy that is available. Think of all the plants on the planet. Once they convert uh, the, ener the sun's energy into a usable form, they need to use that. And so, it, on average, there's only about 10% of energy after, after organisms, uh, functionality systems, the use. Uh, a lot of that energy is going to be lost as heat. There's only about 10% that's going to be able to pass on to the next level. So that makes the, the amount of energy available less, so it makes that level smaller. And then so forth and so forth. So by the time it gets to that top predator, that top predator, when it eats an animal, it's getting very small amount of energy from that animal. And so that means there's going to be less predators available because there's less energy available. Alright, next time we're going to be getting into part 3 which is biogeochemical cycles.